Okay. Okay, this is the City of Davis Human Relations Commission meeting for, for January 27th, 2022. Happy New Year. And I'd like to, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Do you usually post it on the... So Judith, can you see the shared screen? Yes. Okay, so oh, that, will, that will help guide you. Oh, it's right there. I didn't see that, the page changed, okay. So um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and we'll start with a roll call. Carrie, you usually do that? I can go ahead and do that. Uh, Sheila Allen is absent tonight. And so um, Lizelle? Present. Judith? Here. Jordan? Here. Edgar? Here. NJ? Here. Angela? Here. Um, and then I'll note that we've got Leanne here as ex officio and Alistair as ex officio. And Kate will be coming in about 20 minutes, I think she said. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I, so yeah, Sheila usually does that. Okay, good. Um, approval of agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve it. Ms. Angela. Okay, is Angela makes a motion. Is there a second? This is second. Oh, Lisa. <laughs> this is Lizelle. I second. Okay, thank you. And the agenda is approved for tonight. Uh, Judith, I need to go ahead and do roll call, or you can do roll call for approval of the agenda. We just need to go through everybody's names again to say. Uh, yes or no. Would you like me to do it or would you like to call on everybody? I'll go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start with, I'll just go down whoever I see in the order of who I see on my screen. So Edgar? Yes. And uh, Angela? Yes. Um, NJ? Yes. I or nay? Yes or no? Okay, Leanne? Oh, I okay. don't vote. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I don't vote. Very good. Mikhail? I don't vote. Okay. Gloria doesn't vote, I don't think. I need to do this more often. How about every every month? And then I'll get figured out a little better. <laughs> Lizelle? Yes. Okay. Al uh, Alistair? Yes. Alistair, um, oh. Alistair is an ex officio as well. And so ex officios don't vote. Okay, Jordan and Jordan? Yep. And Zoe? Uh, uh, Zoe is city staff, so she does not vote. Well, Judith, myself, I. So okay. the agenda has been approved. Okay. Okay, moving on to item three. Oops. Uh, okay, item three, brief announcements from staff, commissioners, and liaisons. Here, commissioners will share brief announcements, including events, report on meetings attended, interjurisdictional bodies, intercommission liaisons, etc. Are there any announcements? Jordan. Hi everyone. Um, the Social Services Commission meeting this week had a lot of interesting things that happened. Um, if people have time, I encourage you to go watch it. But one of them was that the um, UC Davis had a group that did a study about policing in Davis and they presented the result to the Social Services Commission. And um, I'll probably talk about this more in Local Voices, but the people encouraged the city to have a secondary study done that engages marginalized community voices around policing in Davis, which is exactly what Local Voices does. So I just thought it was great that, you know, one of the studies that people have been asking for has seen results and then they also, you know, kind of endorse the idea of what you all have supported in Local Voices. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Are there any other announcements? Um, just a quick one. Preparations are underway uh, for the Juneteenth um, holiday celebration. 
which is going to be celebrated for the first time as a federal holiday uh, with Lucy Davis and, and the city. So the date is June 5th, uh, June 5th. It's a Sunday, 2022. Uh, mark the date. Um, they will be, I'll be sending a document at some point, an invitation flyer. Second announcement, uh, next month, February is Black History Month. Um, I will be sending to all the commissioners and commissions and uh, city council members an invitation to participate in um, a showing, a four part showing of the documentary, uh, The Cost of Darkness, uh, made by uh, local uh, UC Davis students and Sandy Holman. Uh, so you're all invited to participate and uh, look forward to the uh, announcement by mail. Thank you. Thank you, NJ. I see Edgar's hand up. Thank you. Uh, I just actually just wanted to remind everybody that on Tuesday, it is Lunar New Year. So Gong Hei Fa Choi in Cantonese for all uh, my Chinese um, friends and community, but to all those who celebrate Lunar New Year, which is a very large community, um, it's celebrated in many different ways. Um, and so uh, for those on Tuesday, um, just recognize those who are celebrating the New Year and it's the year of the tiger. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Edgar. And I'm looking to see if there are any more hands up. I don't see any. Uh, Gloria, is yours? Yes. Yes. Okay. My, yes, my hand is up. Hi. Uh, so I thank you for the announcements. Actually, uh, people have uh, taken my announcements, so I don't have a whole lot to add. Thank you, NJ, for, for sharing about the Black History Month. That looks very good. I was trying to find it, actually, because I had seen it somewhere and then couldn't find it because I wanted to repost it. Uh, so I look forward to you sharing that, the... the um, <clears throat> Presentations over the the you know the month of February look really really good, and um, and yes, please remember to um, raise some awareness around the Lunar New Year. Um, and then I was also interested in the survey um, at UC Davis, and I had also reached out to them because I, you know my question was uh, specifically around the the breakout of you know the respondent questions and because I think that's a really important piece. I remember the city did a survey a while back on um, uh, just like quality of life and there were you know a lot of people that mentioned that they felt like we were a really welcoming community but I wanted to know like what you know who who answered that way. I think the um, pulling out the, the data is, is really important. So I'm really glad to see that it, people are, are really asking these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, is there anyone else with any announcements? I'm gonna, if I miss you, just speak out here. I'm going down the list. Uh, I don't see anyone else. Okay, so that's it for, uh, did you have your hand up again, Gloria, or you just didn't, didn't take it there? Okay, all right. That's it. That's, uh, that's it for item three. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Item four, public comments. Public comments may address the commission on matters which are not listed on the agenda. So um, Carrie and I had a discussion about this, uh, and we uh, and correct me if I have it, make sure I have it right, Carrie, that we're going to have to vote on allowing, I don't know how many public commenters we have, but each, because we have a public commenter who would like more time, uh, this is National Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, and he has some slides, some wonderful slides that he'd like to share, and he's requesting more time. So we have to allow every public commenter tonight to get more time. So uh, Carrie, was there like a limit, like six minutes, or was there something suggested at the assistant? It would be the up to the determination of the commission as to how much time you want to allow for public comment, and then that would be um, standardized for the duration of this meeting, not all meetings, but this meeting for each item and um, each member of the public. So it's up to the commission for you guys to. Uh, 
decide how you'd like to proceed. Okay, are there any comments? Angela or Angie, I don't know who put their hand up first. So um, um, just... I was first, uh, whoever is on top. My, uh, just a quick question, actually, for Carrie. Carrie, do we need to um, to place a motion if you want to look at more time? Um, if yes, I guess so. Let's just do that to to make sure that we're accurate, please. Okay, we'll place a motion. Angela, did you have a comment first? Actually, I have a question. <clears throat> I um, I did see the email from the individual asking for extra time. Before we allot extra time, do we have any idea how much time he thought he was going to take? Well, we don't, but I think, you know, what do you think, Carrie? I think we could just agree on something. I think that could be. Yes, I, I think that you guys can go ahead and, and agree on a time. So my thought is six minutes. Is there any discussion around that? Does anyone have any other thought? That's okay. Judith, if you'd like to go six minutes, that makes it easy to um, hit the timer twice. That <laughs> helps it all. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, and how many public uh, commenters do we have tonight? Do you, do you know? It looks like that we've got two people on our attendee side. I don't know how many people, I don't know if, if both of them at this point are wanting to speak or just one. Okay, sounds good. So I would like to make a motion to go six minutes for each public speaker tonight. Uh, uh, and is there a second? Wait, sorry, before we vote, I think NJ had something she wanted to say. Um, yes, no, I was just going to say that I agree and I will be wording the motion as up to six minutes. Okay. Angela, I'll second it. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So it's uh, the motion has been placed and it's been second that we, the public speakers, each have six minutes tonight. Okay, okay. so now you just need to take the vote. Okay, let's vote. Um, uh, let's see. We'll go down the list here. Angela? Aye. Uh, NJ? Aye. Edgar? Yes. Liz, uh, Lizelle? Aye. Alistair? Aye. Um, uh, Judith, Alistair is an ex officio, so he does not need to vote. I forgot about that. Okay. And I'm voting aye. And did I miss anyone? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's Jordan. 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 Wait, sorry, am I voting tonight or not? Yes, Jordan, you are voting tonight. Okay. Jordan? Um, I'll abstain. Abstain. Okay. There, um, it is almost unanimous with one abstention. Um, so should we go forward, Carrie? Yes, you can go ahead and go forward. And then we will just give me one second. Um, to do a couple things, and then we will call for the first uh, public commenter, who is Alan Hirsch. Alan, um, you have the floor. If you'd like to give me a minute, I can go ahead and get your slides up if you'd like. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Would you like me to go ahead and share your please, slides right please now? Please put the slides up. Thank you. I don't, I don't think I'll need, it, need six minutes, but thank you for the graciousness. Okay, I appreciate just that. One um, moment while I... Yeah, I... I asked to be on the agenda. I really hate to be on this next meeting's agenda, and I was disappointed it was not put on this meeting's agenda. I don't understand because we all basically uh, asked, four of you asked, three of you asked, three of actually one person, four people asked to be on the agenda, but somehow this decision was not put on the agenda. This is related to that. Today is International Holocaust Day. And uh, while history does not repeat itself, it does rhyme. Excuse, excuse the uh, misspelling there. It does rhyme. And I'm concerned not so much with the Holocaust. Next slide, please. But in the days before the Holocaust, that before Hitler was elected, when there was still electoral thought. Next slide, please. The, one, the Slide two, please. Slide two, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, in the run-up, which is kind of, which I think is the most analogous, 
Hitler was elected, but he had a practice coup in 1923, and he was put in jail, and he was thought, Hitler was thought it was a joke, but he had armed initialists, he had great conspiracy, he had rallies. Inflation was a great big concern of that period. Communists and labor unions were viewed as a threat to the establishment. People didn't take him seriously. People didn't really act to it, um, react to it. Um, and that's kind of, I'm quite, quite concerned that we, are, we don't have a sense of urgency in, well, we still have act, activity here. We still have act, actions. After Hitler was elected, after the military, after the fashion, we don't have choices. Now we still have choices. We can still take action. Well, I'm concerned we don't have a sense of urgency of that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What do people do when they're confronted with a future threat? We can see what's going on. We can see the future. We see it's rhyming. People tend to freeze. They don't panic. They freeze. They don't take an action. They look around to see what other people do. What's the model? What are our leaders saying to do? They look away. They deny it. The inconvenient truths. It's like climate change. We push away things. We're in kind of denial. We hope, or we hope there's some. We rationalize something miracle happen. Oh, there's an arc of justice somehow. Things will miraculously happen. Or maybe there's some people religious believe there's an end times. This, book, this things will be happen there. Or maybe we look for the strong leader to come in and step forward. Or sometimes we just believe the system will somehow correct itself. America is accepted. It couldn't happen here. Um, I'm suggesting the antidote. I'm suggesting we need to have strong leadership that push back on the status quo, the normalization of hate that's happened, especially through the media. We've accepted that media pumps hate into our community, into all the, into the nation, all Northern California daily. The synagogues that were burned in, Cal in, in 1998 People came from Shasta, they came down here and burned and set fire to three synagogues. We are all in a community here. It's gotta happen everywhere. It's, that's how things happen. We can't just be in a Davis bubble. Next slide, please. I wanna show you what's happened here. This is in, in, the, in, the, in, in the December, right after Trump was elected, the city was shell-shocked. We were so in, afraid. We were in fear. And Phoenix Coalition facilitated a meeting of all the affected people. And we came up with this wall of fear, of all these fears. And they didn't quite come true. There were some threats, but they didn't quite come through. So we kind of let off our guard down. What happened in Germany in 1933, Hitler came, came into power. About half the Jewish population left almost immediately. But three years later, because Hitler didn't push too hard, 150,000 Jews went back into Germany in 1936. I think we're in this place that we think things are all okay. Biden's elected. We need to renew and redouble our efforts. Next slide, things. There's a pervasive fear of, there's, it was, there's a sense that basically we are powerless, we aren't doing anything, there's no one's concern. This is a list of co political contributions of the federal elections things. And the number of contributions between 10 years ago and now has gone up 10 times. People are anxious. They are voting with their money they want. They're afraid that we're, having, we're gonna have lose our democracy. People are voting with giving their money. This is actual political. No one knows this. No one's talked about it, but this is, this is public data. People are active. There's no leadership. No one's pushing back. No one's running. This. No one's basically saying, this is wrong. We Our democracy is at hate. This is the lesson from the Holocaust. It's happening now. When, when, when the election happens in 2024, it's too late. 2022 is too late. Next slide, please. We need, what lessons will we learn from the Holocaust? Is it business as usual? Do we need push? Do we more be more assertive? I'm asking you, the Human Relations Commission. You are the lead. You are the potential place to put raising this. It's not status quo. We need to start working together. Intersectionality of the victims of hate to push back. The status quo, the, st the slow, steady process is not going to work. We need to be think. I asked that media hate be put on the agenda in November. It's not on the agenda now. I don't understand why there isn't a sense of urgency. And I'm asking there to be a renewed sense of urgency to take action. We need to push. Thank you much for listening. I am scared. I am scared as a Jew, but everyone should be scared and minority groups should be scared because this is what's going on. We know what's happening. Don't freeze, take action. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Alan. Okay, just one minute, please.
Okay. Um, Judith, I'm going to just see if there's anybody else who is has public comment. If, if there's anybody else with public comment, please raise your hand. All righty, I don't see anybody for um, public comment. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Yes, that'd be great. Okay, item five, consent calendar. November 18 meeting minutes, we have to approve the consent calendar. This is just a vote, right, Carrie? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, hold on. Sorry. That was my timer for public comment. <laughs> okay. So a vote. Uh, once again, how about Edgar? I or nay? Judah, somebody needs to make a motion. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Okay. All right. Uh, would someone please I move to approve the consent calendar. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you. There's been a motion and it's been seconded. Now we'll vote. Aye or nay? Uh, Edgar? Aye. Angela? Abstain. Okay. Uh, Jordan? Aye. Giselle? Aye. And I vote aye. I haven't voted. Excuse me? I'm voting I too. I was on hold. You know, I didn't. Sorry about it, that, NJ. Your photo doesn't come up here right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, thank you so much for speaking up. Um, so it is, again, almost unanimous with one abstention. Um, so basically, the consent calendar has been approved. Yes. Would you like me to move to the next item? Yes, I would. Thank you, Kira. Okay, item 6A, recap of the Joint Human Relations Commission and City Council meeting. The commission had a joint meeting with the City Council on January 11th. They will recap the discussion and identify and prioritize work, work tasks. Yes, so I'd like to share a document with you guys to provide you some um, just memory of, of what was discussed. So just give me one moment to be able to do that. All right, can, can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right, so just um, to guide your discussion a little bit, here is um, the areas that you requested guidance or direction. And then we've also got some other topics that came up as interest from the city council. So this is just an opportunity uh, for you guys before too much time got away to have any discussion on um, your joint meeting with the city council and to uh, see if there's anything that you need to identify working on beyond what is already in kind of established subcommittees, et cetera. Okay. I have a clarification question. Yes, Jordan. Um, under the first bullet point in the italicized text, it says council is interested in the commission researching policy and language and working with local tribes. That means they're interested in us researching policy in other places. They're not interested in our research policy. Well, correct. They'd like you to research, you know, the, the proper way to develop a land acknowledgement. And that's, you know, been done through UC Davis and through the school district. So those might be good places to start and then have the subcommittee come back with a proposal to city council with some some ideas and suggestions on how um, moving forward with a land acknowledgement could work. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Oh, Angela, I have a question. Yes, Angela. Yeah, so on all these areas where we have requested um, staff and commissioners, how and when will we get responses to those um, type of questions? I, you know, I think that the, um, probably that answer will vary. Some of it, Angela, will need to go through our legal to find out what we can do. And um, and so I unfortunately I can't give you an exact answer. I'm I'm happy to you know provide updates as I receive them. Sorry, I don't have a better for you answer for you right at this very very moment. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so we have subcommittees working on particularly at least these four bullet points. First of all, are there subcommittees? You have, you have subcommittees working on the land acknowledgement. Um, the top four bullet points was the, these were the things that you'd ask council for direction on. And so uh, staff will be needing to work with, um, you know, attorneys, et cetera, to find out more about the sponsorship policy and the, how to address local happenings, which I know has been a, a big concern of the commission. And we um, have issues with the Brown Act, et cetera. And then um, wanting some direction on working with external organizations as a commission. The council did respond that they thought that, you know, as appropriate, it is great for the commission to work on, you know, with organizations with direction from them, on, you know, who have, are like-minded with uh, commissioner functions. And then below those sort of things, so of those top four bullets, I think that you've already got your um, subcommittee working on the land acknowledgement, and then the other ones are sort of in staff's hands right now. Then the other topics that came up as interest from the city council, which you guys may want to discuss a little bit, are bridging the student population with the city. We actually do have a um, subcommittee working on that and, and making great strides. And then there was a request from uh, one of the council members to develop maybe some partnerships and some sort of cross collaboration with other commissions. And there was a request from the commissioners to receive more clear guidance on that. So, so I believe that the city clerk's office is working on something with that. Um, the council was also interested in proactive community outreach and you know maybe how the commission could could assist in that. And I know that outreach has been, you know, is one of the main goals on the work plan for the commission this year. And then creating local forums that create space, you know, uh, for community members to feel safe and share. I, and the anti-Asian hate subcommittee, they have been talking about doing some sort of forum. So that's something that support, could sort of lend itself to that, that idea. And then lastly, I think that this was something that came up, but was probably just addressed at the council meeting and nothing to do at this point. Um, uh, council member Carson was interested to hear your all thoughts on, you know, behaviors in, da in Davis surrounding COVID fatigue. And I know that Kate Snow in particular was able to respond to that in terms of students, et cetera. So you guys are already doing quite a bit of this work. The purpose of this recap wasn't really necessarily for you to create any extra work for yourselves or anything, but just to um, have a few minutes to, to chat about the meeting to see if there was any, you know, clarifying questions as Jordan had or anything else that you wanted to discuss. So this, this item could be very, very short if you feel like you guys are in a good spot with it, or you could um, uh, chat to discuss more. Okay, okay, that was, I have something to say, but Angela, you have your hand up, go ahead. Uh, just a real quick question. Um, when we talked about um, partnerships and cross collaboration, I know we were asking for how how can we do that, but I, I I'm not real clear. When we're asking for the council to come up with a policy, is this a policy that would work for all of the different um, commissions, or are, are we seeking specifically for us and whichever ones that we felt we would want to collaborate with? I was a little amiss on that. I, my understanding was this that if there were topics that um, maybe were similar ones that you know multiple commissions were working on that and this so it wouldn't just be necessarily for you because there might be two totally unrelated commissions but they're working on their own kind of thing so I, I believe the idea would be um, more of a generalized way of doing things okay. so so is there and I know you don't have a timeline on that one but given the fact that we had talked about it, how, again, it, this is something that could take months to do, or I, I, I'm just a little confused as to how these processes really work. So I, I do believe the clerk's office is currently working on um, some sort of document at this time to uh, provide some guidance and to maybe identify topics of, you Wonderful. know, crossover. Great, thank you. Thank you, Angela. And Jay, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, just a clarifying question regarding uh, the Commission researching policy and language um, and land acknowledgement. If I remember well, uh, do we already have a land acknowledgement subcommittee? Uh, yes, we, we, we do, NJ. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Yes, we do. Anyone else? Let's see. I want to say that uh, I don't see any hands anyway, so. 
uh, Kara, I want to say thank you because that was my question. Did we get a response yet from the city council? And you did answer that. They're working on, uh, we have a subcommittee for the land acknowledgement and they responded. Could you remind me again uh, which one they responded to? You, you just, you said it, you, they gave a response to one of them, either the co-sponsorship or the national local happenings. No, it, it was not either one of those. It was the um, kind of cross collaboration with other commissions. Okay, all right. So, so we're just still waiting for the response. Also, what is our ne next task? as far as the topics that the city council is addressing. Well, well, I think that you guys do have your work plan that you're still following along with. And and um, all of these, for the most part, fell under different items within your work plan already. I see, I see, that's right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, all right, any other comments? MJ? No, I'm sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Okay, all right. Judith? Yes. Please, uh, no rush, but please let me know when you're ready for me to stop sharing this and move to public comment for this particular item. Ah, thank you for the reminder. Let's move to public comment for this particular item. <laughs> okay, just give me one moment so I can. All right. I'm not seeing, is there any public comment for this item? Alan, please go ahead. I would urge your commission to push the city council to speak out more on media hate. We are in unusual times. We need to do new things. The old ways are not working. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other co public comment? I do not see any other public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can probably move on to the next item. Okay, just one moment. Sometimes when this timer gets going, <laughs> there yeah. we go. Okay. Okay, now a report of the Martin Luther King celebration. Uh, the commission will discuss the 2022 virtual Martin Luther King Jr. virtual tribute, discuss what was successful and ways that could be improved for future events, virtual or otherwise. Yes. Is there any comment? Would you like me to provide you just a little bit of information that I gathered after the viewings? Would that be helpful? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so uh, as you know, um, you know, the commission has not met since November, and when we met in November, we were going all set to have an in-person celebration, and we were moving forward with the Martin Luther King um, subcommittee, making great strides to identify in-person speakers and performers. And when we got back from um, the holiday break, we, you know, things were spiking with Omicron, and we had to make a very quick decision to move into a virtual format. And um, so that took quite a bit of work, but I'm you know, very grateful the subcommittee was amazing and still you know, working with these people to make this happen. So we did end up moving into a virtual format and doing it a little bit differently than we've done before. It, it's, um, you know, it took, it was trial, trial and error, I think, and we probably should talk about what was great about it and you know, where we need to tweak it. What we had done previously for both Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and then outside of this commission for tree lighting in 2020 was, to have um, an entire video posted on YouTube and then just available on our city website. For this particular uh, Martin Luther King celebration, we had multiple, a total of seven short videos and we posted them through our city social media so that the idea would be that they were, they popped up every hour for people to see and hopefully people would see them in their feed. So they were on the, the city of Davis um, Facebook page and then I shared them to the human relations page and then the idea or the hope was that from there people would share them so that we would continue to get more and more viewings. And um, I think overall it was great. We did have 
a total of 616 views um, on the various videos, not all kind of the same ones. The top two were um, around the kitchen table with Deborah Taylor. She was fascinating. And then also our um, two poet, our poet laureate with her colleague, Tracy Gordine, who did um, poems. And those were both, both also wonderful. Individually, those each got 195 views. And then, as I said, totaling all the videos was 616. Uh, which actually, you know, hit more people um, when we would hold it at the bar city. I believe that that capacity was in the high 200s, maybe close to 300. So that's a little bit of information to let you know, you know, kind of how many viewings there were. Um, certainly, I have some thoughts about things I, I would like to do differently if we were to have to do this again. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of it. So, <laughs> um, Carrie, first I want to add, and then I'll check for hands. I want to uh, when I when I went on the, the link for the five minute of the video, uh, you know the march to Mont march to Montgomery the Montgomery march. Uh, it it went to a private Vimeo link link and didn't let me in. Did you hear any comments from anyone about having problems accessing? The five minute video with John Pamperin and everyone. I did not, but I will check on that. I appreciate you saying that. Um, it worked for me, but um, I'll I'll do a double check. Thank you for that feedback. Okay, you're welcome. So Jordan. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is unrelated to Martin Luther King. I think there might be feedback from someone's mic when people are talking. So if you're not talking, just mute. Is it good? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any comments about the MLK virtual celebration this year? I thought it was terrific. NJ, that was quite a writing, quite a writing job you did. That was quite extensive and detailed and quite a wonderful intro and of course Gloria's uh, now Gloria did she have did you have a video that I just saw the writing on the city of Davis it was a written paragraph is that okay so that is correct thank you Gloria thank you. yes thank you so much any other comments Leanne mm -hmm. yeah I I liked uh, having a little piece of it every hour um it was kind of fun to keep going back oh what's new now so I enjoyed seeing them um, coming out, you know, not all at once. And of course, I loved the, the one with uh, Dick Holstock and John Pamperin and Terry Turner. Mm -hmm. I've seen that several times and I love it. Wonderful. Thank you, Leanne. Gloria, have you hand up? Yes. So um, I thought I thought it was great. I thought it was, you know, unfortunately, I was so disappointed that we couldn't do that in person. Um, but it, it was a, a great pivot. Um, I love the children. The children are always uh, a highlight. And, uh, and I really love that our poet laureate invited uh, another person to speak with her. And that person, I, I really enjoyed the, the reading that she gave. Um, I was also in, you know, in hindsight, right? So I think the city of Woodland did their Martin Luther King celebration outside. And I thought, you know, wow, why didn't we think of that? It would have been, I think that would have um, worked for us as well. Uh, so something to, to consider, I think. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Gloria. And Jake. Yes, um, I want to thank again the, the commission and, and the city for supporting that celebration. Um, thanking, um, yeah, it, it just, I, I just felt like during the preparation, there was such a, a spirit of solidarity and it was so positive. I'll also like to thank um, Lizelle and Edgar um, for all the feedback you provided as well regarding the, the introduction um, that was said at the beginning. Um, among the highlights, one of my great pleasures um, with this format was that I was able to share it with my network online. So I noticed that there were some people not from Davis, even on the East Coast, who reposted, um, shared, you know, on their page, um, some of the videos. And so that was really amazing. So moving forward, if next year we have that event in person, um, I second what Mayor Partida said in hoping that maybe we consider having it outdoor, maybe in Central Park also, if at all possible, uh, if the weather permits, of course. Um, but if also we can 
<clears throat> excuse me, managed to make it hybrid so that as in the previous year, we also do have something to share online, um, if possible on the day of, um, even if it's not the entire event, but I think there is something so special about showing the rest of the world how in Davis, we go about celebrating um, one of our social justice icon. And then the last piece of feedback I would like to offer um, I would like to thank the team that uh, took care of the graphic design and, and the formatting of all the posts. It was wonderfully done. It was so professional. Um, the advice I will give is <clears throat> on the day of, um, if in the future we post a snippet of the event or videos, just so we know, um, it's easier for those to be clicked on and shared uh, if we can see the image of the speaker. And that is a kind of a draw um, to the audience. And also YouTube videos, they all have a, I forgot the name now, um, but kind of like a cover picture. So if we put the YouTube link, but at the same time we put a picture uh, like the, the flyer that was put on with like some quotes and notes, then we don't get to see um, who is presenting and we don't get the YouTube title um, in the post. And um, I'm just sharing that because it's going to not encourage as many people to, to share on their page. And the other thing is that it's not as personal a connection with whoever is speaking um, in, in that case. That's all I have to share. And again, thank you so much. OK, thank you, NJ. And um, Glory, did you have something else, or did you just not take your hand up? OK, all right. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Is there any other discussion about this? Very interesting. Oh, I did. Go ahead. Liz L has her hand up, and then we also have public comment, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. There's Liz L. Okay, Liz L, go ahead. Um, I did want to thank, you know, Carrie for all of your seamless kind of uh, wrangling of, of all of the um, the speakers and the presenters and, and it was just a, a really flawless, you know, behind the scenes that you had gone in and, and, and helped, you know, make this this wonderful celebration. I think one of the things that, um, you know, I'd be interested to see if we could maybe Potent I know that um, in the past, um, it was shared that the celebration, like the planning had, had been a, a part of a subcommittee um, group. And so just something to consider um, for the commission that, um, you know, for the next um, for the next uh, planning of, of, of the celebration, it might be also good to um, have another subcommittee kind of work on it. Um, you know, in the background and, and, and help present updates, you know, so that um, it, uh, that that we could really have um, a really great representation across the community of, um, you know, the celebration. So just one thing to, to add um, for future planning. Okay, thank you, Lizelle. And I do hear from some people that they'd like to have Deborah Taylor back to, to share more stories. It's, it's like she just got started, you know, so. Well, she, was, she was fascinating, Judith. Thank you for, for connecting with her. You're very welcome. Yeah, she was really great. Okay, anything else from anyone? I don't see any hands at the moment. Would you like me to move to public comment? Yeah, thank you very much. Public comment. Mm -hmm. Let me see. We have two public comments. Okay. Um, Alan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. One suggestion. Um, is that Martin Luther King's struggle in the South was not with the cities, but also with the merchants. So I'm suggest we should give the merchants an opportunity of our city to be involved with these programs to affirm that they are not going to turn back to the old ways. It's very important that we, unity in our community includes the business community, not just the activist community. The second comment is I want to observe that there was no publicity about this virtual event in the Davis Enterprise. Not the city's fault, the city sent the press release out on Thursday at noon. There was no reason it could have been the Friday and the Sunday paper, but obviously it wasn't in either. But the Enterprise did run a cartoon that was critical of Biden's speech asking for voting rights, which was the core of Martin Luther King's program. We have a problem with the Davis Enterprise. It does not correctly reflect our community. 
Do you know it never reported that 90% of the citizens of Davis voted for Biden? They never reported that fact. They have a significant right-wing bias in the op-ed articles they choose. But we should be more assertive and ask the, the, the enterprise to reflect the values of our community. That's really important and that they didn't put Martin Luther King Day celebration or even put an op-ed in, I think is pretty questionable where they reflect the values of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Is there another public speaker? Yes, we do. Just one moment. Um, Connor, just give me a minute to start the timer, please, OK? OK. You know, sometimes this is the fumbly part of it. <laughs> My apologies. I've got to get it back to it. There we go. All right, Connor. Go ahead. Okay. There you go. Thank you for your patience. Okay. So first off, um, I so I had to come in late, so I didn't hear this full item, but I did just want to uh, mention that as we celebrate MLK, uh, like both on MLK Day and on the during the rest of the year, uh, we have to remember the larger structural issues that he was fighting against, which includes racism as well as capitalism and imperialism. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I think hybrid options uh, for events going forward are important. So I, I do, I would be in favor of trying to do that as much as possible. I understand that it, it would be more labor, but I do think having uh, remote options for people who need or want them uh, is an important thing, even after we're out of COVID. Uh, and then finally, I will uh, just mention that there does seem to be a bit of feedback. So if people who aren't speaking could mute, I think that would be helpful as well. Okay. Thank you so much for your comments. Are there any other public speakers? I, I don't I see anybody else with their hand raised. Okay. All right. So that concludes the discussion about the Martin Luther King celebration. And whenever you can, move on to the next slide. There you go. OK. Annual Tong High Wind Awards. The commission will re review the timeline and categories for this nomination. Yes. Would you like a little background on it? Sure. sure. OK. Um, so this is our annual Tong Hai Win Award that you, the HRC oversees each year. And there typically isn't a whole lot of change. Um, a couple of years ago, the commission really reviewed the categories and made some edits to them. After last year's win awards, there was no recommendations for changes at that point, but you certainly could do them now if you'd like. Um, the nomination or the categories are uh, lifetime achievement, young humanitarian, civil rights advocacy, excellent in community involvement, and public servant of the year. Some years, all, all categories receive, uh, have a recipient. Other years, some categories have no recipients. And some years, categories have more than one recipient. So really, there's the flexibility of the commission um, to determine based on the nominations that are received each year. We usually open up the uh, nomination period in February, and it goes for um, about a month to five weeks. The nominations are then turned in. The commission will review them and make recommendations of the recipients to the city council. Um, we often have to extend the deadline for either all of the categories or sometimes a portion of the categories. And um, after the commission recommendation, it goes to city council for them to ratify. So what that means is in typically in April, you guys would send your recommendation and, and before the actual celebration happens, the council would approve your decision. And then in May is when the recognition portion happens. You know, previously and in um, the old days, we would have a lovely in-person ceremony with a food reception, et cetera. 
last year we did it on uh, Zoom and it was still very nice, um, you know, certainly not the same, but we would, uh, you know, depending on where we are with council meetings at that time, we would make the determination. And so for tonight for you guys is really just to decide if you wanted to make any changes to any of the categories or if there was any concerns about the um, nominate or I'm sorry, the guidelines or the nomination form. So I can pull those up for you if you'd like to, you know, have that in front of you to do a quick review, or you can you tell me what you like. Okay, I think the forms in front of us and a discussion at the same time um, would work. Okay. Uh, sure. And NJ, I think you had your hand up first. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. I want to thank Carrie for um, yes for for sharing the forms. That will be helpful. Uh, a comment that I remember having in the past from um, I'm trying to nominate someone last year. Uh, I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be um, for the for next year possible to uh, either look at the form again to see if we are um, making it a bit easier to fill. Um, because there are some, some questions that are asked, I believe, that are not that easy to answer when we're nominating someone because there are some details that we might not have. And then my, my second um, request, um, Judith, I was wondering, um, please, if it will be um, possible that you mute yourself um, if you're not talking, because unfortunately, we have an echo uh, that resonates when the carrier or someone else um, takes the mic. That, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I pulled up the nomination guidelines, but it sounds like maybe we should start with the form based on NJ's comment. Is that okay? Sounds great. Okay, I will I will pull up the um, actual form instead. Okay, uh, Edgar, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was just looking at the form um, as well, but I wanted to ask Carrie, uh, what were the number of applicants for the last uh, year? And is there a trend of, you know, having not as many as we'd like? Um, I don't know, like, I, I wanna try to make this more known. And if there's things that we can do to get this out into the community more, I feel like, um, you know, as a small group, we uh, are, are kind of task, but mostly, you know, Carrie, I, I, I know you do a lot of the work to kind of get it out there, but that's, I feel like we need to do more. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm curious. So maybe Carrie, do you want to answer that first? Like how many people do you remember about applied and were there any that didn't have any applicants? I can't remember. Um, yes, I just, I, I couldn't remember either. So I pulled it up real quickly while you were asking. We did not have any nominations for the Lifetime Achievement Award. We had three for Young Humanitarian, two of which were the same person, uh, one for Civil Rights Advocacy, one for Excellent in Community Involvement, and one for Public Servant of the Year. Um, that we... Mm, we may in the past have had a couple of more than that, but we usually don't get a ton of nominations. Thank you. That that really helps. Um, and I think this is something that we actually spoke about in, in our subcommittee uh, that I'd, I'd like to just kind of bring up was, you know, on the issue of, you know, why this award was even created in the beginning um, and to kind of recognize folks uh, so I would I would love um, to move forward with whatever we're going to do this year, um, but to maybe have like uh, a more thorough discussion on, you know, the awareness and education behind this award, and then just how you know getting actually publicity out um, and making an actual effort to not sorry not making an actual effort, but more of an effort utilizing all of us to get that word out so that we can actually have more uh, applicants in the future. Carrie, in what ways do we get the word out about this award right now? What are the, what have we been uh, doing? Typically through the enterprise, through our press release channels, through our social media, you know, through our Facebook and on um, the Human Relations Commission. And then certainly we've, you know, we usually typically will have a flyer created 
and then you know ask um, commissioners to share that out with their contacts etc you know certainly we can always improve upon our outreach and would love for suggestions on sort of more robust publicity ways that, that sounds great when we do the enterprise is it an announcement or is it like an article with a background about the reasons why we started this it, it's typically a press release that we'll put together and we'll have a, a quote from mayor partita included in there and the enterprise will usually run it as a press release okay uh any other comments uh kate I just want to say that at various times, I, I also share it with our school counselors and I share it with principals and um, and different individuals in the district. Um, and I'll say that for the students who have been awarded it, it's really it's been very meaningful. Um, many times I you know I hear parents refer to it later or students refer to it later, like how how important it was to them to have the award. Um, I also ha have I'm wondering about uh i i feel like the often we talk about it it starts with a murder right it starts with a death um when we describe why the, we have the award and i wonder if when we frame it maybe maybe we frame it in terms of a, a listing of the kinds of things that young people have done in the past or people who have gotten the award have done in the past you know a dance performance, uh, 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 an event, uh, you know, whatever the things are that we highlighted, um, put those up front as examples and then get to the what's behind it. Um, I don't know, I, I, just thinking and I'm happy to work on language if that's helpful at all. I like that. Thank you, Kate. I think it's a great idea. Um, any other comments, uh, Edgar? Mm -hmm. I just would like to just add, you know, I would love to open this up to, the UC Davis student population, as well as to like staff and faculty who are working on this. I'm sure they are in some ways, but maybe um, bridging it out more just because I know a lot of the students that I work with are doing amazing things uh, on these types of topics. So, um, you know, you know, it's my responsibility as well, you know, to get it out there and to make them known. Okay, thank you, Edgar. Thank you, everyone. I'm looking. Lizelle. Lizelle has her hands up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to, to echo Edgar in terms of, you know, when we had um, you know, one of the one of the goals that we we all have, I think, on on the commission is, you know, how do we do more effective outreach to different organizations? And I think this is one of the examples of ways in which we have concrete, you know, initiatives that um, we can really definitely amplify. And um, Kate, I love your, you know, your idea. Um, around the framing and the importance of framing and um, of also celebration, you know? So it's it's really an example of how our community has taken such a, a tragic um, moment in our history and, and really turned it into something that is um, impactful and, and, it, and it continues to, to be um, a legacy in honor of, you know, Something that um, was 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 definitely tragic in our community, but something that the, the our community has turned into, um, uh, yeah, that lasting legacy. So, um, and I think you know, for for um, our subcommittee um, around um, anti hate, uh, it's something that I think um, we can also continue to work on in in um, trying to to see how what we can do to amplify across the community. Thank you, Lizelle. Um, NJ, I think you have your hand up. Uh, I do. Thank you for calling my name. Um, Kate, I would like to thank you so much for your words. They, they resonate deeply with me. And bouncing on that, um, I was wondering, I, I think it's definitely um, a great opportunity, um, as you hinted at, to, you know, either when we make the announcement or when we share with our networks, it will be great if uh, maybe the city puts out just a highlight of some past winners. Um, it doesn't have to be many, just, you know, maybe one or two, uh, as Kate was saying in, in celebration and acknowledgement, acknowledgement of what has been done. And also in my in my opinion, so that the past winners, we, we also, you know, have a chance to remember their contribution because it wasn't just a one-time 
thank you for doing it. But it, it is an alleged that the seed they planted back then still has, uh, is still bearing fruit uh, in our community today. And then the second thing I wanted to ask, I was wondering, not to put you on the spot, Michael and Alistair, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this topic and, and outreach and students' involvement and UC Davis. Thank you. Sure. I mean, one of the things that we discussed in the past is what it would mean for potentially a member of the Human Relations Commission to sit in the UC Davis campus um, council community and diversity. And that would be the opportunity to uh, talk about this award because the members of that particular council um, include uh, student and student leaders along with um, DEI practitioners. So that would be I would say the most effective way of uh, doing outreach in this regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any comment, Alistair, or are you good? Okay. Any other comments on this topic? And thank you, Carrie, for the timeline and, and, and showing us the forms and reminding us. And so we- I think uh, we're NJ, NJ, did you have a comment on the form? Carrie, thanks for asking. I was wondering if you could scroll down um, a little bit. Sure. Thank Just you. Small. Because I remember, okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm grateful that we have, it's not necessary to answer every question because I remember in the past that I struggled with um, some of the answers, like what other special recognitions have been awarded to the individual business or organization? That one sometimes has been challenging to answer. Um, okay, I think that's about it. When I'm rereading it, um, everything seems just, I don't know, easy, easy to feel. I'm trying to remember what my struggle was or if I felt like I was, you know, short on time or something to answer all of it. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing the form with us again. Sure. Okay, so as a group, we, we are just like with the MLK so far, we're not forming a subcommittee for this or we are. We're not. No, there's there's no reason to. Um, we and before we make any decisions, I just want to remind you to have public comment. But at this point, if if you're fine with the timeline and the categories as they are, you would just make a motion to to move forward with it for this year. Um, I, you know, of course, you want to take public comment before you make any sort of of motion. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we're ready for public comment now. Is there any public speaker here? Okay, just let me get the screen reshare. Because I do believe we have a public comment, so I want to get that prepared. Hi, Alan? thank you very much. Thank go. you very Thank you very much. Uh, two, two short comments. One is I think you need to make it clear right at the top of the form what the relationship of the nominee is to the city of Davis. So the students of UC Davis are appropriate, or is it someone who commutes into Davis can maybe be part of it? I think you should be clear about that. And the second is, if you have trouble getting nominations, don't push water uphill, don't deflate the, don't deflate the value of the award by just giving it to whoever it is there. I would say if there's not good candidates in a particular category, you should basically not, not, not nominate one. There's no reason to basically push, push things up. Some years I'm sure they're overflowing. Some years maybe you're a little parsed. With with the community, so with the, with the quarantine, probably people aren't haven't been out as much. So I would not be surprised we haven't seen as many active visible candidates. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public speakers? Public comment? Um, you're muted, Carrie. Sorry, I was trying to follow rules. I do not see any other public speakers at this time. So you guys can go back to the item and decide how you'd like to proceed. Okay. Um, 
So I believe we are asking for a motion and a second. I think that's what you did take there. Is there a motion to move forward with, with this item? I motion that we move forward with this item as it is written and has been presented. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, I think that was Alistair, right? Yeah. It was, it was Edgar. Edgar. Excuse me, I wasn't, yeah, excuse me. It wouldn't be Alistair anyway. Okay, Edgar. Okay. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Kerry. I'm sorry. May I? Oh, please. Second, please. Okay. Yes. Oh. Uh, no, I wanted to um, thinking of what um, Alan just said about clarifying the eligibility. Uh, is this something though that we want to amend to the document? I'm, I should have asked before we vote. We made the motion. That's okay. You you can discuss right now. Um, you, if you want to amend the form, then you would want to decide to do that before you take a motion to accept it as it was. Yeah. Um, so that would be up to you guys to, to discuss if you wanted to add something to the form. So I would like to point out that even though I presented a motion and it was seconded, we haven't voted on it yet. So maybe if people, um, I see that Angela would like to say something. If, if you would like to discuss it, now is a good time, I guess. Yeah, I just, I guess my question in Jay is, are you asking to change the application or I'm assuming the definition goes with the application, right, Carrie? The definition of- Meaning what each one of the different awards are, like you showed us the initial form and then went to the application. Uh-huh. So so that is attached to the application also, correct? Correct. It would seem to me that maybe what NJ is talking about would go on that form rather than on the application. So I think what I was referring to was mostly the eligibility aspect when Alan mentioned correct. if the people who are eligible are people who commute to Davis as well or just the residents. Um, I was wondering if we need to make it clearer on the form. Well, I was thinking not on the application okay. specifically, but on the, the page that has all the criteria. So, so the guidelines says, um, let's see, it has all the award categories with the descriptions. And then it says it's designed to be as inclusive and as transparent as possible. So it talks about what the process is. It may be submitted by anyone, including human relations commissioners or city council members. Current commission members or elected officials may not be nominated for an award. Commissioners cannot nominate a family member, partner, or spouse. Nominees should be residents of the day of Davis or have been active in work that has impacted the Davis community. Nominations must be submitted via the form. Um, each nomination should be for only one category. And then it goes into the selection process that you cannot receive the award if you've received it in the last 10 years. Um, if a commissioner has a conflict of interest, i.e., you know, a family member or something has gotten um, nominated that you would uh, recuse yourself. And um, that if the commission determines no nominations received in a particular category are appropriate, no award will be presented in that category. So it actually does state the whom by saying a city, um, a resident and or. Yes. So NJ, are you suggesting that there be more added to that particular section? Uh, no, that is the clarification that I needed to hear. And Carrie, I thank you very much for uh, reading that section and Angela for asking. So I maintain the motion as I had presented it. Okay, thank you for the discussion. And NJ, you maintain the motion as presented. Is there a, uh, is there a second? I believe someone did second, but uh, uh, Edgar, did you second it? Yeah, okay. It's, there's been a motion and it's been second. So um, we vote now, okay, aye or nay. Um, so Edgar. Aye. Angela. Aye. NJ. Aye. Uh, Lizelle. Aye. Kate, are you voting or not? I forget. No, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. And I vote aye. So this motion has been passed. Wait, I also vote aye. Didn't I say, who's that? 
Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. That was Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's unanimous. This motion has been passed. Public, um, we did the public comment. Okay, moving on to committee updates. Committees will provide updates as needed. So going down the list, uh, we'll start with the Asian American and Pacific Islander outreach. Are there any updates? Yes, uh, we actually have prepared a presentation um, that we are going to share. So, um, Carrie, do I have the ability to share screen? Now? You should have the ability. I stopped sharing and all panelists should be able to share. So please let me know if you run into issue. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so just bear with us. Uh, we, uh, this commission has gone, or the committee has gone through uh, multiple names. And so we started out as the anti-Asian hate subcommittee. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing it here now as the Asian American Pacific Islander Outreach Co Subcommittee. Uh, and I think we're now moving towards like an anti-hate uh, subcommittee. Uh, we will hammer that out. Regardless, we have put together and we've worked really hard on a presentation that we just wanted um, to help uh, bring light to uh, the topic that originated this uh, subcommittee in the beginning. So I'm gonna share my screen. Give me one second. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. So I first, um, let me get my other screen set up so I can get all this ready to go so I can see my notes. All right, so first off, um, you know, this all, our subcommittee first formed um, because of a slew of uh, anti-Asian hate crimes that was happening um, in the last couple of years. And, you know, the intention of this uh, presentation is more educational awareness building and to really begin a discussion um, to kind of allow the commission to kind of know, okay, what is actually happening? We may not be seeing things in the news, but there is still um, this growing trend of uh, hate crimes that have been happening across the country. And across the world as well. Um, I really wanted to just appreciate the fact that we are even given this space to talk about this uh, in this setting. And I also really wanna thank um, Lizelle and NJ uh, for working on this project. Um, you know, this is, I think uh, for us, like a labor of love. Uh, and so, you know, I think we're really proud to uh, put this together for the commission. So um, with that, I will go to the next slide. And this is Lizelle. Thanks, Edgar. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, we wanted to really frame um, our discussion today, you know, um, around, uh, you know, the moment in history where um, uh, we had a community member that was um, murdered and we had just talked about now honoring the legacy. So, um, uh, this is one, uh, I actually will skip over sharing this, but um, last year K KRCA, uh, KCRA had um, done a feature um, uh, around, um, you know, Tong Hai Nguyen, Nguyen, Nguyen and, um, you know, the efforts that uh, community members have, have done, especially at Davis High, um, in really bridging um, uh, bridging and, and, and making sure that this, um, you know, doesn't happen uh, again in, in Davis. So, um, you know, Edgar, we could actually skip over. So um, uh, this slide. He was killed. Okay. Okay, so this is me. Um, it is very important that we acknowledge the fact that there was a dramatic rise in anti-Asian hate crimes uh, with the association of the coronavirus um, as you know, having uh, been caused by the Asian community. And the American Journal of Public Health um, singled out the former president uh, Trump tweet where he called uh, the coronavirus the um, Chinese virus. And they basically made a link between 
that tweet uh, with the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. And many of the news media um, have also followed in that path and in reporting and making a link between all of that. Um, so it's just something that we wanted to point out. And with that, uh, we were reminded tonight by a community member, Alan Hirsch, about um, media hate and how to keep the media accountable. So it's something that I want us to keep in mind as we're going through that presentation, the role of the media and the language that's being used with the public when it comes to, to um, inter-Asian hate crimes. Next slide. Thank you, Edgar. So the next one, I just wanted to have a trigger warning for those um, who uh, may be disturbed by violent acts. Um, I'm not going to show any videos, but there will be some images. So this is just a slight warning. Um, so as you know, there was the slew, and this is just to kind of refresh us on what actually had happened that made the news. Um, and there were several heinous attacks that happened um, in this first picture. It was a 91-year-old Chinese male who was violently shoved uh, to the ground. That same day, this person had also attacked a 60 and 55-year-old in Oakland. Um, in this picture, uh, it was an 85-year-old Chinese man uh, in San Francisco who was just sitting waiting for the bus and someone just came up and kicked him out of his walker. He was knocked unconscious and spent four days uh, in the hospital. Luckily, he survived. Um, in this picture, it's a little grainy, but this was in New York City where a 65-year-old Filipino immigrant was violently shoved and kicked in the stomach and head in broad daylight. And the attacker yelled, you know, you don't belong here. Uh, three security guards who witnessed the attack saw the woman struggling to stand up and they closed the door uh, to their luxury apartment. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this was uh, an 84-year-old Thai senior who was jumped and violently shoved to the ground. And sadly, he actually died. So um, in terms of, you know, with all of these um, incidences happening um, and, and crimes that are happening, um, it is actually something where um, what we hear on the media is just uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and, and in this one instance, um, on March 16, uh, 2021, Robert Aaron Long shot and killed eight people, six of them who were Asian women. Um, and these killings really brought to the national attention the biases and discrepancies within our country of how hate crimes are classified and prosecuted. Despite the fact that in this instance, this was a case where the murder provide empirical evidence that shootings were really motivated by racism. Uh, both reporting and prosecution um, of hate crimes are exceedingly low. According to a, 19, a 2019 study from Syracuse University, uh, state attorneys referred hate crime cases to the federal government for prosecution 2,000 times over the previous decade. Only 15% of those referrals led to prosecutions. Um, three states, Arkansas, South Carolina, and Wyoming, don't have hate crime laws at all. And 17 others have laws that don't require data collection of offenses. Um, this was also a case that illustrates um, the national report statistics by the organization Stop AAPI Hate, that 62% of all hate incidences reported by the AAPI community are um, reported by women. Next slide. So um, about two weeks ago, the Los Angeles Times reported a survey that was done in the San Gabriel Valley where it was found that about, you know, half of the, so it was about experiencing racism during the pandemic in the um, API community. About half of the people surveyed said that they feel less safe not less safe now than before the pandemic. The majority of them express being more vigilant and defensive when they're leaving their home. And the majority are worried about their children being bullied and insulted at school. So just to give you, um, and this is just a small sample, but just to give you an idea of the pressure um, that that community is under. Next slide. And I think the value of all of this is that this is all recent. You know, the, the slide that Andrew just showed you know, was reported just as of, you know, two weeks ago. And so it just shows how 
um, how much fear there is, it's still in the community. And, you know, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, it, it's not heard. And as of just the other day, you know, many of you heard about um, a very sad uh, moment where uh, a young Asian American woman who was in uh, the subway waiting for a train uh, was shoved uh, into the train and was killed. Well, you know, She's actually born uh, in Berkeley, raised in Fremont. She's Northern Californian. And, you know, it, it just, it really kind of touched um, a lot of, uh, I think, my personal community. I had uh, friends who actually went to school with her. Um, and it, for, it, really, it really hit home that this isn't over yet and that there is still a lot of fear. And whether or not things are even deemed a hate crime or not, it doesn't dilute the fact that there is a lot of fear in the community and that that fear is recognized. So from that, what we wanna do, and this is the more the meat of the presentation, and thank you for bearing with us here. Um, we wanted to report uh, about some key statistics. And this is the part that we really wanted to um, highlight and what we did was we went through the Stop AAPI Hate report and pulled out some key charts and graphs that I think uh, this commission you know, will be helpful. And I want, as you're looking at these uh, charts and graphs, I want you to think about what catches you, like what stands out, what are uh, statistics that you were surprised to see, uh, because I think it's it's really important to know that you know people are still tracking this. The Stop AAPI Hate uh, organization was formed by three groups, the AAPI Equity Alliance, Chinese for Affirmative Action, and then the Asian American Studies Department at SF State. And through that, they worked really hard to create a system, all digital, all online, to, to actually track, have reporting um, of anti-Asian hate crimes. They also did something on public uh, mental health um, and the stress as well as they have done multiple surveys uh, about the amount of fear that is still out there. Uh, it, I think it's really important that we recognize that, you know, from 2020 to 2021, the amount of incidents that have occurred have actually still increased. 4,599 in 2020 and 5,771 in 2021. So even though you may not be hearing about it, it's still quite um, relevant. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to show you some charts. Some of them might be small, so I apologize for that. Um, I wanted to give them their due justice because of all the hard work they did. But this is a breakdown of the types of discrimination that was reported through their online system. And, and just take a look at it. Uh, the top reported was the well, type of discrimination was in harassment, 66.8%. Avoidance or shunning, 16.3%. Physical assault, 16.1%. Online misconduct, 86 Coughed at or spat upon, 82 Job description, uh, hostile work environment, 57 And the list goes on and on and on. Um, and just take a second to kind of look at this chart. And then the next chart actually breaks it down even more. And you can see this where they actually take harassment and break it into five different subcategories, um, verbal hate speech, behavioral bullying, gestures, written uh, hate, hate letters, sexual harassment. Um, but it, it's nice that they actually show you like, okay, who, what are the- Edgar, Edgar um, we're not seeing the charts, just- just oh my god! I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry. We're I am so sorry. I've been slide. pushing the wrong screen. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. So here is the harassment chart, um, and I'm glad I read out the percentages. Uh, but here you go: uh, the harassment, avoidance, or shunning, physical assault, uh, and then the next chart breaks it down a little bit more. Um, so in the actual harassment, they have five the subcategories, verbal hate speech, behavioral gestures, written, uh, and sexual harassment. And I'll just give you a second to kind of look through each category and all the subcategories of how they actually broke down the different reportings. Um, and you know, if something sticks out, I want you to remember that uh, because we'll ask you at the end um, why that was surprising or you know, something that kind of you know, hit home with you. Um, the next chart I have is the different sites of discrimination. Uh, and this kind of just shows you where the majority of them happen in public streets. Uh, next is at business, bus I'm clicking the wrong computer again, businesses, um, 
at 26.8%, uh, private residence at 10.2%, um, and uh, online, public transportation, public parks, schools, uh, and university or colleges, and the list keeps going. This is it broken down by subcategory. So again, looking at public streets, uh, most of it happens on the streets or sidewalk. And again, this is uh, what is actually reported, um, which I think is really important to note. Uh, and then next, um, NJ will go into the different demographics. Thank you, Edgar. So um, it's, you know, it's important to notice that the majority of the people who are able to report those hit incidents uh, are between 26 years old and 45 years old. So that makes up for over 50% uh, of all the reports. And next slide, please. And when it comes to the gender of the respondents, 62% um, are female and 31% um, are male, and then we have three person who uh, express being non-binary and four person who declined to specify their gender. Next slide. Oh, thank you. So here we have the ethnicity of the respondents who reported the hate crimes. Um, again, I will give you also a few seconds to take it in. Notice the disparity, um, the, the ethnic group that is the most under attack um, as reported, so, and it is the Chinese community with 42.7%, then followed by the Korean community and the Filipino, Filipinex community and Japanese and on. Thank you, Edgar. And so just um, wanted to provide a bit more context in terms of, you know, um, our, our community. And so um, with, um, with this slide, you can see um, the, the breakdown um, of, of the demographic. In our community, um, we have almost uh, one fourth of our community um, of Asian alone, and that doesn't account for, um, you know, some of the community members maybe reporting um, two or more races as well. Um, next slide. And this gives you um, another sense of um, just even further double clicking into um, uh, the, the UC uh, and, and the breakdown of, of our demographics. Next slide, Edgar. And you can see this even further broken down in terms of undergraduate um, demographics. And then the next slide um, under uh, graduate student demographics. And then um, our next slide uh, showing the demographics of um, faculty member uh, at UC Davis. And next slide. So um, this is a mental health report. Asian Americans are more stressed from inter-Asian hate than COVID. I'm going to let those words sink. So we are aware that COVID is already putting so many of us, not all of us, under a certain level of stress, which is already very, very high. So if we're receiving reports that from the APR community that they are more stressed from anti-Asian hate crimes than of COVID, let's just take a minute to, to think of the impact that those hated crime is having on them on top of everything that, you know, as a community we're already dealing for. Some of the key findings that Asian Americans who have experienced racism, uh, as I mentioned, they're more stressed about that than, than uh, the pandemic. One in five Asian Americans who have experienced racism display racial trauma, uh, the psychological and emotional harm caused by racism. And I'm taking the time to read what is on the slide um, in case we have community member who tune in um, and are not able to see those slides and can only have access to the audio. After reporting Asian Americans, after reporting Asian Americans who have experienced racism have lower race-based traumatic stress. This is also very important because it expresses that it is um, essential that the community have access to means of reporting a hate crime. 
Um, Asian Americans who have experienced racism have heightened symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, and physical symptoms, which when it comes to um, the work and responsibility of our community and our city, the underlying question is how easy is the access to mental health care? Next slide. So after hearing all of this, you know, the big thing we want to have the commission do is kind of just reflect on some of the statistics you just heard, some of the stories that you just heard, and you know, really what kind of surprised you the most. Um, and we'll give some time for folks to kind of uh, discuss it for whatever we're allowed. Uh, I know we're going a little bit longer, so we apologize for that. But you know, really think about what was some of the most surprising statistics. And then, you know, really, you know, based on this discussion is the next question is what, you know, what do we do as a community to address this? And what is the role of the AHRC and all of this? And I think we're excited um, as this subcommittee starts off uh, where we can use this as kind of like our launching pad to kind of take our program of whatever we're going to be doing um, as a subcommittee um, and our goal is to you know, set some annual goals for us to be hitting and to be going out into the community, doing outreach, uh, but also to kind of also do educational stuff uh, similar to this, to bring in maybe new information and statistics. So thank you so much to Lizelle and NJ, and thank you for all uh, of you for uh, sitting and listening and bearing with us to hear all this information. So with that, um, we are done. Okay, I'm gonna go. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the statistic that NJ met has paused for is, you know, very impactful to me is understanding how COVID has impacted my life and then being like, there's actually a stressor for many people out there that they are more worried about than COVID. You know, it puts it in perspective and it makes it very real. And I think that I have kind of two thoughts. One is that the HRC serves as advisory to city council um, but I don't think that I'm necessarily like very qualified to be answering this question. And so I'm interested in, you know, what research is out there about best practices, about what people have done in communities to make their marginalized community members safer. Because I think that like the HRC can give it, you know, advice, but I think we don't have to be the ones generating the ideas necessarily. I'm sure that there have been like peer reviewed studies that have been doing and studying these things. Um, and then also I think I liked what Edgar said and I wanna echo like, you know, we can do all this research and then we can kind of take like a Davis focus on it. So like people in Davis, what are they worried about? What are they stressed about? What would make them feel comfortable? And so kind of merging those two things. Those are my ideas. Thank you, Jordan. Um... Someone just had their hand up. Was it Angela? I did have all I was going to say is that um, well done. Thank you very much. But I think the two things that really surprised me the most, and although the numbers were not great, the very young children and the fact that people are spitting on people, I had no idea. Thank you. Are there any other comments specifically regarding Edgar's request for specific responses? Um, I had the same response as Jordan. Seeing the stress of the, of the Asian people stressed out more about this than the pandemic. That was that was quite something. So, any other comments? I have my hand raised. There you are, right? <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, yes, I just, I think, um, you know, while working on this and, and, you know, something that stands out to me once again is the importance of outreach and how much of a difference it makes for people of all ages and for the community. So for me, the underlying question in the work we're doing as a commission, and also, especially when it comes to, um, hate crimes is, you know, there is the outreach that we are already doing, but what is, what can we do more? You know, um, we are sharing information in our local community about, you know, this is a number you can call. I know it's on the city's website, et cetera, et cetera. But 
do we have we explored all the means of sharing that information? Have we explored all the ways where we can more easily reach students? You know, they don't necessarily go on a specific website to look for that. Um, so, and then also another thing that really struck me was the importance of mental health, which I think hasn't really been at the center of most conversation during this pandemic. And before the pandemic started, I just remember that every year almost, it seemed as if uh, on a federal level <clears throat> and sometimes state level, the mental health care budget kept being cut. And all those numbers we just looked at just, you know, they remind us of how important it is um, so that we be able to function as a community. You know, do we, I'm grateful that we now have a new department um, in our city. Um, but again, I think it stresses the importance of staying vigilant and, and making sure that we create and continue to provide access to, to some of those essential services and, and to means of communication for the community. Thank you. Thank you, NJ. Um, Kate and Gloria have their hands up. I don't know who was first. I think Kate was first. So I, I'm pretty sure. Kate, go ahead. Um just wanted to say, I think the things that stand in my mind, because I'm so focused on a particular age range, that it was helpful to have the, the data around the age range of the affected individuals and um, the sort of demographics of the community around age. And, um, and I'm also prompted me to think about there are... Um, what are the safe spaces on our campuses? Our, our, K-12 campuses and, and what would make campuses more safe and what processes would we come to to understand what students would feel, how students would feel more safe. And it also makes me think about what are the intergenerational community ways we can somehow, you know, what are the intergenerational activities we could do to um, build a stronger community um, and anti-hate community. And then my third thing is if we're doing anti-hate, then, then we must be pro-love, right? Thank you, Kate. Excellent, uh, and Gloria. So thank you, thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation, uh, wonderful, not wonderful presentation, if you know what I mean. Um, and I really appreciate the, the comments that have been put forth, uh, Jordan, especially, um, you know, around what can, what can, um, you know, communities are, are like the cities and the counties, what can they do specifically to make people feel safer or to actually increase that safety, not just make them feel safer. And it's, and it's been very challenging. I remember very early on, we had a, um, a summit with uh, you know, county and a, a couple of other jurisdictions and have that conversation. And so it, it's hard to uh, legislate, uh, you know, people to, to treat each other with respect. It's, it's very difficult. But that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, ways that as a community, we can send a message uh, to everyone th that says that people are accepted. And I think one of the places that I've thought of is through our senior center, uh, because Many of, the, uh, many of the people in the Asian community that are targeted are older. And, um, and so I've, I've wondered if, you know, through the outreach that our senior center does, if they can, you know, reach out and, and just ask if, if people feel like they're safe, if there are any things that can be done to make them feel safer um, and just doing check-ins with, with folks. And I think that that would um, you know, go a long way to making people at least be seen in, in our community. And I remember last year talking to Kate because I'm over at Marguerite Montgomery and they're in the kindergarten uh, class. And there was, um, you know, a couple of young children that said they had to stay away from uh, one of their Asian classmates because he was going to give them, um, you know, coronavirus. And and so, you know, when I talked to Kate about it, I said, you know, there, we have to think ahead uh, so that teachers aren't scrambling to, to 
um, have resources about what to do or have messaging out about what to do and how to deal with those situations as they come up. Because when I talked to the classroom teacher, she was, you know, appalled and, and said, you know, she would, uh, you know, talk to the students and talk to the parents. And, but I, I imagine that's not an easy conversation. And so if there is, if we know that this is going to happen, we, you know, this is how many years after Trump was running and my grandson came home from elementary school saying that, you know, all the Mexicans were going to be sent out of the country. And he was upset about that. And so we, it's not the first time around. And I, I feel like we need to have tools at the ready and sort of have a, a, a playbook or of sorts to know what to do in those situations. Thank you, Lori. Um, Kate, did you have something else or was your hand just, you just. At the risk of taking up too much airtime, I wanna say, I think Lori, what comes to mind is one thing we have at the ready is we're teaching our young people to be upstanders, right? That there's an upstander carnival and that upstanding goes for every situation, right? And so I feel like you, you know, you personally are part of setting that ground level knowledge and, and skill base for students, but I think that's one example. Okay, and uh, NJ, do you have your hand up again? Yes, I, I just wanted to thank everyone who's commenting and let you know that I've been very inspired by your words and they are filling me with hope. Thank you. Okay, anyone else on this topic, this particular committee? I don't see any other hands. Are we ready to move on to the next committee? Okay. Yes, you can move to the next committee and then typically you would take um, public comment at the end of all of the committee updates and the members of the public could speak to all of the committees if that works for you. That okay, is a great. typical process. Okay. Perfect, thank you, Carrie. Okay, moving on to Local Voices Project. Uh, Andrew Jordan and Angela. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a presentation. It's um, not as comprehensive as the one that we just saw, but there's a lot of visuals to the um, Local Voices update. So I just wanted to be able to show folks them. Um, I'm going to stop your screen sharing, Carrie. Is that okay? Yeah, Jordan, that's fine. And is it the um, attachments that you had sent earlier or is this something different? It's the attachments I had sent earlier, but in a presentation format, basically. Right, perfectly. Can you just go ahead and email me the presentation later so I can save it in the file? Yes, definitely can do. Okay, thank you. Yes, we'll, here, I'll stop sharing. There you okay. go. Let me go do that right now. Okay, so, um, hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. Uh, Local Voices is ready to launch into data collection. We're very excited. Um, we have been in prep for this for so long, trying to make sure that the wording is right and that we are inclusive to the communities we are trying to outreach to. So we are sending our uh, materials around to our connectors and also to you all. It was in your inbox today. Um, Carrie, I think, sent a follow-up email with all of the stuff that I will talk about here. Um, so if you have any edits, please feel free to reach out to you know me or NJ. Um, and then once those are ready to go, we will send them out and they will circulate through our partner networks for our first round of intensive testimonial collection. Um, okay, so first we have a website. This is what the website looks like. Um, you can go to davislocalvoices.wordpress.com and it has a link to our data survey in English and Spanish and also sharing a testimonial in English and Spanish. So the data survey has demographic questions about the people taking it and also kind of tries to measure the rates of incidents of police interactions in Davis and the testimonial survey or testimonial form is where people can share more in-depth stories and you know experiences of interacting with the Davis Police Department. So we have both of those there, you know, kind of presenting options to people based on what they would like to tell us. Um, and then also you can see at the top, we talk about privacy and how we are keeping people's data private. We talk about us. We also list like our sponsors on the site so that people kind of know, you know, who we are. Um, we also have an outreach flyer in English. This is what it looks like. Um, it basically covers all the things that I just said. Um, experiences regarding Davis Police 
department. We are trying to get interactions with the last five to 10 years. We have a QR code. We offer people gift cards. We say, if you want to do it anonymously, you can email us. Just trying to, you know, make sure that we are getting all of the things that people might want or need in this process, because we are trying to, you know, ensure their safety and gather their stories. This is what it looks like in Spanish. So it says all of the same things, except in Spanish. Um, we have a wonderful translation team that does all of this work for us. Okay, so we um, also have a hard copy survey. So that was just a flyer to tell people about it so they could access it online. We also have an ability for people to fill it out just like in person if they want. Um, we don't have the Spanish version yet, but this is what the first page looks like. So you can see it's like a trifold flyer that has our website, it has our sponsors, um, it has our statement of consent. We talk about privacy, all of these things. Um, thank you to all our sponsors, including the Human Relations Commission. Um, and then we also have, you know, the inside of the survey will be this. So it's a lot of questions from the two surveys that are on the website so that people can fill this out in person if they would like. Demographic questions, incident questions, anything that we think, you know, might be relevant or important to know when someone is describing police interactions. We also, again, as you can see, questions 11 and 12 offer gift cards. Um, okay, so we have outreach emails that we will be doing. Um, so this is, you know, when we ask people to send out our materials or to take our surveys. This is what that looks like. This is also in the email that you got in your inbox today. It has the same information that I have covered in the previous things. We're trying to be consistent. You get a gift card if you participate. You can fill out the form and tell us your story. Um, we have a Proton Mail email address, which is a secure email. Um, and here it is again in Spanish. Um, Hona Miranda is on our translation team. Uh, yeah. So that's my presentation. Those are all the materials we've been working on for the past year. And does anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? NJ. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to thank you, Jordan, for this really good presentation and the team behind LVP by extension, everyone who's offered support. And this is really the culmination of months and months of work and community contribution. Um, so just thank you for the, the hard work that you've all done. Thank you, NJ and Kate. <laughs> I echo what NJ said, and I just bravo. I'm really impressed with the persistence and the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness with which you have developed all this and how what has come out at the end is something straightforward and um, easily, you know, easy to interact with. And so I just very much appreciate all the work you put into this. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Wonderful presentation, Jordan. I concur with your comments. Thank you. Yeah, and if anyone notices anything later on, if you look over the materials, we're talking like typos to also like philosophical errors or questions, you can always reach out. Okay, and Angie, do you have your hand up again? Uh, yes, just something I wanted to, to add, thank you. Um, something that I really appreciate with um, the way Local Voices Project has been working is how they focus on inclusivity, not just around the language, but how they made the material available in English as well. And I'm hoping that that is inspiring to other, um, you know, either community organizations or the efforts that, that is put out there. Um, I want to point out, having worked on other forums in that capacity, I want to point out that it's not always easy to find necessarily find either Spanish translators, or it also requires a budget because you want to be mindful of people's times um, and skills and expertise. Um, but I'm hoping that you know somehow in the community we see more and more of that um, language um, accessibility. Um, and I'm hoping I don't know that if that exists yet, but it will be amazing if 
there is um, an easy to find kind of directory of uh, translators, not just in Spanish, um, and interpreters in our community that nonprofit and other groups know they can go to um, if needed. And I believe that UC Davis also might have, um, I know there is a department, linguistic department, so maybe some students uh, will be interested in, in you know, some, some type of work in that capacity as a volunteer work for the community. Just a thought that I'm, I'm putting out there with the hope that it, is, it inspires us to keep that standard that we just saw. Okay, thank you, NJ. And are there any final comments before we move on to the next committee update? Hey, I'm wondering who you have in mind for uh, distributing this? Like who we're going to send it to? Well, what you, well, what organizations are you going to ask to, to help distribute? Um, we have a whole list that we've kind of been collecting. So we had people that came to roundtable conversations and gave us feedback on the initial things that were from various organizations, and we'll send it to them. But um, I think we were probably going to contact a lot of community-based organizations in Davis working off a list, partially a list that Carrie sent me and then a list that some other people have been kind of creating and updating over the past year or so. I realize that's not specific. Did you want like specific well, names? No, no. Specifically, I think that I'm wondering if it would be something that the police department would put out if they've made contact with folks. I think we had, we talked about this because I believe when they were like ticketing people at one point, they were sending out a survey also like afterwards asking them. So I think there was a conversation about it, but I cannot remember what the conclusion was. So thank you for bringing it up again. I will look into this. Okay, yes. And I think that I looked through the survey and I looked through the materials. I, I think they're very good. They're very clean. And um, and I, I'm uh, you know really pleased with them. Um, the, the one thing that I would maybe wonder about is, um, if there is a way to, to let people know that it's like all interactions and it's for like all people. I know it's very, it's very uh, open-ended, I, I get that, but I, I'm just wondering in the, in the current um, climate, if you know, there, there are definitely some folks who are in a different camp and I'd, I'd like for them to be able to, to give input as well. And also, you know, there are, like I have a, a very good friend who's, who had a, a negative interaction, her son had a, a negative interaction and, um, and, and was not a person of color. And I don't know if she would, you know, think that you wanna hear from her. Those are both very good points. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, you know, deliberately in our materials don't ever like um, put a valence on like positive or negative interactions, but we can make it clear that we're trying to gather all of them. And also, if people have had an interaction that they feel like is particularly noteworthy, that they should feel free to, you know, fill out our survey um, or just in general, if you've interacted with the police. So those are good notes about things we can be making clear. Thank you. Okay, we've got NJ and then Angela. Um, thank you, Judith. Um, it's a, my question is to Mayor Partida. I was wondering um, when you mentioned, um, you know, make it clear that all types of reports are welcome and interaction. I was wondering if there is something in the language that was used on the form that prompted your comment. I noticed the word incident, for example. So I was wondering if that could have been, um, what, what prompted your suggestions? Because it is true that the intent is to record um, and to be able to um, collect all types of um, experiences. No, I, I was just thinking that in the context of our times that, that people may read something into it and to just be very clear. Thank you. Hey, Angela? Yes, as a reminder, um, the reason that I am on this particular um, 
committee is because I am uh, on the um, community advisory board for the police. So if there is anything that needs to be brought either direction, you know, certainly let me know. We did not have a meeting uh, this month and I can't remember, I think we did in December, but there has been really no mention of this at all at any of our meetings. So um, maybe um, Jordan, you'd want to get with me or somebody get with me to let me know specifically if there's information you'd like me to carry forth. Yeah, thank you. I will return to our team and see if there's things. Yeah. Okay, we'll thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. I don't see any other hands up at this time. Um, okay, so I think we can move on to the next committee update. Yes, so the next one on the list is um, commission topic of um, inventory, which Helen was on. Helen has resigned from the commission and that will conclude this um, subcommittee. Uh, separately, I believe that there is some work being done internally that um, through the, the clerk's office on a, a similar type of project that will have some information that you know might be of interest. We talked about that a little bit earlier. So wanted to let you know there will be no update and I will remove this committee from future agendas. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Next is the UC Davis connection. Helen Cope and Wong Chen. Mm -hmm. Is there a discussion? Yeah, we do have an update. Alistair, are you, are you there? There you go. Um, yeah, about the, can I speak on the project? Yeah. Um, so I am in the process of um, organizing a project surrounding um, kind of coordinating with different uh, campus groups, which uh, I believe are kind of um, most involved in in social issues and issues that I would say are pertinent and like necessary to to discuss. And I haven't reached out to all of these groups and commissions yet, but I'm in the process of uh, establishing like a rap a rap work with with um, a few of them. And so this project is kind of, it's starting, it's getting off the ground. And I was wondering if I could, um, I was actually considering having some of these groups um, do like a brief speech um, in our next meeting or in future meetings. Um, it's just, it's not like final finalized yet this project, but it's still in its initial stages, so. I just thought I'd give an update about um, this project that I'm spearheading. Um, right now I'm communicating with the, uh, one of the groups is the SRCC um, Student Recruitment and Retention Center. Um, and I'm getting more information and establishing dialogue. So really looking forward to this project. Alistair, I'm so sorry. I think I missed what the actual project is. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, it's basically just uh, establishing rapport with uh, campus organizations, UC Davis, and uh, groups, and getting getting more information, and so that they can present um, to with to the commission to city staff and we can start kind of uh bridging the gap between these groups and uh you know city admin city admin um so it's kind of like i'm kind of acting as like a moderator mediator between uh city and uh campus these select organizations thank you that that was very helpful, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you, and Edgar, did you wanna, I know NJ, you have your hand up. Edgar, did you wanna add to anything? Uh, yeah, uh, NJ, let me just add a little bit uh, something first. I mean, I think one of the main purposes uh, we were talking about this project was just kind of um, 
opening up dialogue and kind of talking and letting different students who have gone through different experiences or student organizations or student services on the campus come and talk about the different issues that students are going through that they may be experiencing on campus on city grounds, just so we can start hearing from different perspectives from the student um, services and organizations that are actually dealing with those particular issues. So some of the groups that we kind of narrowed down was the SRC, Student Recruitment Retention Center, Cross Cultural Center. Um, we also uh, were on the list was like the Women's Resource and Research Center, um, you know, and um, the LGBTQIA Center. So we wanted to kind of reach out to kind of give a small breath of space for them to kind of just say, hey, this is what's happening to our students on campus and off campus. And these are the things that we're hearing about. Maybe they'll have like their director come, maybe they'll have a student speak, but we were hoping to kind of line up some of these student services and student orgs to just come and do a really quick presentation to kind of give us an update of what student life is like now and for these particular groups. Um, and I think it would just be helpful because these are the orgs uh, and services that are dealing directly with it. So we, I think what we were hoping to get is some feedback from the commission to see like, can we move forward with this? Is this something that the commission would want us to do? Uh, and if so, then we'll start lining up uh, uh, these groups and services to just come and do brief you know, presentations. Okay, um, maybe we'll go to NJ next. Uh, yes, thank you. You couldn't hear me, but I've been clapping all along. This has been such a wonderful way to, to end the day. Uh, Alistair and Edgar, thank you so, so, so very much. Because I remember when I first ran the commission about a year ago, something that Mayor Partida shared was the hope that uh, the city, they will, will be able to help bridge a gap between the city and the campus, for example, and all those different entities, like just be more aware of what is happening and some of the ways where maybe we can help support the effort, not necessarily by doing something, you know, but at least if we know we can amplify, we can let other people know, hey, this exists and, and all. So I just want to, I'm very, very grateful to both of you for um, heading in that direction, because I think that you are helping us as a commission achieve one of the goals that we've said about um, a year ago. I'm very excited about what is coming next. Um, I look forward to hearing from some of the groups that you mentioned in the near future. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, NJ. And Kira, did we want to address right now what Edgar brought up about wanting to move forward uh, or bring it uh, or uh, table? I mean, I, I think you could sort of just do it by consensus if, you know, this is the work of the sub subcommittee was bridging the gap. And so I think if, if the commission sort of overall decides that they want to put it on a, a future end agenda item, item to, you know, to be determined on space on the agenda and stuff, we certainly can do that. Okay, put it on for next month's agenda. How's that sound? Let's let's I'm not sure it would be necessarily on next month's agenda, but if we could put it on the long range future agenda items and then that would give us some time to to work through uh, some upcoming agenda items and see what makes the most sense. Um, I'm happy then to coordinate with whoever's chair at that time and the subcommittee to see when they'd like to invite the groups if, if that uh, works at the pleasure of the commission. That sounds great. Uh, NJ, you had a comment? Uh, yes, I was wondering if it will be um, if understood well. So the com the committee's updates are happening at every meeting, right? So my question is what Edgar and um, Alistair just mentioned, meaning, you know, having um, one of the groups, you know, occasionally come and just give a brief presentation of, of their work, anything else they would like to share with the commission that is can we be clear on the, the process around that and the language? So my understanding is that it will happen during uh, the um, during the subcommittee update, UC Davis connection update. And if it's the case, I see Edgar nodding yes. Um, can we be clear as a commission and understand it's, you know, at some point it might go over, but do we have an allocated time we want to let the presenters know ahead of time? So you have five minutes. So uh, is it something we could, um, if it doesn't take us too long, is it something we can agree on in terms of, um, you know, time allocated for guests? Uh, for me, it's it's helpful to know if 
when setting the agenda, if there's going to be presentations versus just an update so that we can have a better idea, you know, our, our meetings are set for two hours typically to conclude at 830. So if we ha are going to have um, a presentation of any sort, which is fabulous, it's just helpful to know ahead of time if that's coming for a setting the you know, kind of the rest of the agenda to know how much is going to be on there. Um, so I think having it during this, you know, specific update time is great. Having a, a heads up of, you know, at least a couple of weeks would be um, really helpful for agenda purposes. Okay. Um. I think MJ has her hand up again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, I'll keep this great just to answer. Uh, to react to Carrie's uh, words, I was wondering if, um, if you know, once we know that there will be a guest for one of those updates, I think it will be very helpful if we're able to have it in writing um, in the in the agenda. I'm guessing it's going to be the case, but I just want to word it so that we know this group is going to be there and they will do a presentation. And I'm sharing that because I think that it will be of interest to members of the public to know ahead of time. Okay, and thank you. And Ed Edgar, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this brief. I think the goal is that, you know, Alistair is going to reach out to several of these groups and we're going to just going to be lining them up. So we'll hopefully, knowing exactly when our commission meetings are, we're just going to have specific groups ask them, hey, do you want to come to this month's meeting? So we'll, you know, as he's meeting them, then we'll start scheduling them way out in advance. And if, and I think some of the questions we wanted to throw back to the commission is, are there other groups or student services that you would like to hear from? about kind of what is going on uh, in their experience and their, their interaction with students. So, you know, thinking of different communities or transfer students or graduate students, whatever that may be, um, you know, let's use this connection to bring those people to the commission and hear from. Okay, thank you everyone. I think that wraps up our uh, discussion of the UC Davis Connection Committee update. Um, let's move on to the event sponsor process. Lizelle and Edgar, do you have an update? No updates here. No updates, mm. Edgar? Nothing yet. Okay, uh, NJ, did you have your hand up? Um, yes, I did. I just wanted to utter the words Black Student Union to Edgar. He will understand the message. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you. Okay, moving on now. Um, going on to the community calendar. We have Lizelle, NJ, uh, Edgar. Um, I, I'll get started if it's okay with my uh, fellow commissioners. So I mentioned, I was the one who asked um, that we, the commission works on establishing a community calendar. Um, I, I've been working on it with a uh, student, UC Davis student, um, she's a student international relations. She's been providing her time in gathering information. I wanna share with um, you know, the commission that as a subcommittee, we haven't been able to meet yet as a group. And also because um, you know, the group was formally established sometime after I got started on it, but I believe not to speak ahead of time, it's going to happen at some point. Um, I will be sending to um, everyone on this list, the information that I have. And also the last piece um, of data that I would like to share, uh, what has been on my mind, because I've been wondering if it will be possible not to costly, not adding workload to our wonderful staff, but if, we'll be, you know, if we should be considering that community calendar uh, as uh, something that can be interactive. So that will mean creating a page um, and you know, someone could be hired for that. That could then be added to the website, like you know, the proper code or so. So I, it's just a thought. <clears throat> it's not to be discussed tonight. I'm just letting you know uh, some of the the ways I've been um, thinking about the model for what I'm talking about is the Davis Dirt, where community members are able to add events that are then vetted and and before you know they they published and and shared with the public. Um, and again, like I said, please don't be scared. Um, you know, um, this is just a thought and, and that's it. Um, thank you, I'm done speaking. Thank you, NJ. Uh, Mikhail, or did I get your name right? Is it Mikhail? Mikhail? 
uh, you or Edgar or Lizelle, do you have any comments? Michael, no further comments. Michael, okay, thank you. No further comments, okay. Yeah, I just think from my end, you know, uh, this is gonna be a, a pretty big project and just kind of pulling everything together, weighing out what the options are. We just need to kind of sit down and brainstorm and we just haven't had that opportunity yet. So I think once we have an opportunity to sit down, then we can kind of set some goals. Okay, thank you. Lizelle, ditto? <laughs> ditto, same thing. Did you have any final comments? Okay, you're all good. Thank you so much, everyone. And the last uh, committee update is land acknowledgements. Is there an update from the members? Let's see. I think this just got established. Uh, it did it just, um, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Oh, I just said, did, there was a really good article that came out. I think it was either in San Diego or Los Angeles about land, acknowledge, land acknowledgements. Um, I'll try to find it and send it out to the group. Um, just talking about, you know, the steps beyond just doing a land acknowledgement. And I think it was really uh, powerful. Um, and so I'll send it out to the group. Uh, I had bookmarked it, but now I can't find it. So I apologize. Okay, thank you, Edgar. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next slide. We have a public comment. Are there any, is there any public comment for this part of the meeting? Yes, we have um, uh, two public comments. Connor, um, let's see. Okay, go ahead, Connor. If I can do this right. Okay, Connor, you're got the floor. Okay, so I, I wanted to speak on the UC Davis connection. Uh, so first off, I want to mention that I believe the Social Services Commission is also doing some outreach to UC Davis groups and communities. Uh, so that's something to be aware of and to potentially even collaborate with, whether informally or maybe even formally through like a two by two or or a joint, a temporary joint subcommittee or something. Um, then I also um, wanted to mention that I'm very glad that uh, the idea here is to reach out to student centered groups because uh, very often when the city collaborates with the university, they only talk to the administrators uh, who are often uh, very different with very different perspectives than the students and the workers. So I'm glad that student groups are being uh, discussed and that those conversations are happening. And I think the centers are good student groups to be communicating with. Uh, but I do think there are some other student groups that uh, might be relevant to this commission as well, especially some of the student like clubs and organizations. In particular, there's Students for Justice in Palestine, there's Jewish Voice for Peace, there's UC Access Now, which is about disability justice. So there's those types of student groups. And then also unions uh, and in general, uh, collaborating with UC workers, I think can be important as well. Um, especially, I would say, after. AFSME 3299, which represents service and patient care workers who are also disproportionately low income and people of color, but also all of the other workers and unions as well. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention is that there are a lot of concerns and questions around the UC's response to COVID as well as disability justice more broadly. So there is a statewide virtual town hall tomorrow uh, that anyone who's affiliated with the UC can attend uh, that is about the COVID response and also about more long-term disability justice and the idea of trying to get hybrid options long-term uh, so that people who need or want to be remote uh, even beyond COVID are able to do so. Um, in addition to people who uh, need to or want to be in person, being able to do that as well. Um, so one, this is all over social media and a few other places. Uh, one good place to get it for anyone who's interested is the Facebook page UCD for COLA. Okay, thank you, Connor. And the next public comment?
Thank you. This is Alan Hirsch. Those were those were wonderful presentations. I wish I had them in advance. I thought Gary Glory can inform me. Aren't those supposed to be? Aren't those? There were no staff reports, including the minutes on the uh, city website seventy-two hours before this meeting. Uh, it was kind of hard to basically prepare things. Isn't that a requirement that we make these available in advance? Um, I'm told that I can go to City Hall and get them, but I, I when I when I inquired, I was kind of disappointed by that response. I know mistakes are made sometimes, but uh, I, I hope we can, uh, because these reports should really be available in advance. I think that's the best appropriate way of doing this thing. I, I know we can do better in the future. The, the second comment was the Asian Pacific thing. It's it kind of frustrating. We have we have an hour worth of discussion, and you have public comment at the very end. You have multiple presentations. I thought the process was we have questions public comment and then discussion, not multiple presentations. I mean, I mean, if there's multiple public commenters, I think it's one thing, but we have only one or two public commenters. So it's kind of hard to basically summarize all these public comments and all these presentations on which occurred 45 minutes ago. I mean, I, if you really want public input, maybe you don't, I don't know, maybe you want to move things along, but it just doesn't seem the most productive way of getting input. So uh, take it for what that's worth. But on the Asian Pacific Islander thing, we're talking about treating the problem, treating the fear, but prevention is better than treatment. Shouldn't we figure out where the source of all this pain is coming from? That what's happening is the media is coming down and triggering people and people who are vulnerable have mental problems are most likely the ones that are attacking. So why don't, why don't we figure out what's going on and who's stimulating this thing? And I, again, I'm suggesting the media, of course, but what's stimulating these hate attacks? Hate attacks against Jews, the synagogue recently, against Muslims, against Asian Pacific. What's the source of this thing? Let's let's look at the source. This who's triggering the stochastic violence that's happening randomly here. Again, that's that's my thought line for that one. So it's one to track the violence and treat the treatment. But let's get let's we should be focused upstream is a little bit more. And okay, the local voices project. It's a wonderful project. I've actually took your, your tiny URL up and went and filled in the survey while you were talking. It's a wonderful survey. I hope you pre-tested it. It's, it's a wonderful project to getting input. To, I'd also look for, to be credible with the police, because that's the people you want to influence. Look for people in the community who've had good experiences with the police too. Because if you have a balance, they're more likely to listen to you. A little honey as well as the garlic. We know we're going to find the other stuff that's bad stuff that's happening. But if you can find some honey, you're more likely to get the police to listen to you and change the culture of that institution because we really need to reform our police. I think that's positive. And I suggest also, you might, the committee might want to look, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Talking to Strangers. It's a wonderful book. It talks about the dilemmas of how the police have set up to cause conflicts. So that's a wonderful book to read, uh, Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. It kind of changed my perspective of what's going on here. Uh, so thank you very much for all your hard work. And I, I, this is, this is to me, it's so integrally important in terms of maintaining, keeping us together as a diverse democratic community. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And thank you everyone for um, all the updates and public comments and everything regarding this particular part of the meeting. So now we're gonna move on. Okay. Just, just one minute. Sorry. No problem. I went too far. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now it's time for election of chair and vice chair. The commission will elect a chair and vice chair for 2022. And I nominate NJ for chair. I second that one. Okay. Before you vote, please make sure NJ accepts her nomination. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm surprised by the nomination, but I also appreciate the vote of confidence. So thank you. It will be my honor to serve you all and in our community as a chair of our commission. Wonderful. Now, do we vote on this now or? Okay, so um, NJ has been nominated. There's been a second. She's accepted. And we'll uh, and we will now vote. Okay, uh, Edgar. I, I apologize. You should see if there's any other nominations. Oh, excuse me. Good point. Are there any other nominations for chair of the of the Human Relations Commission? And NJ, you have your hand up. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not related to what you asked. I was just wondering if I should abstain to vote. If, if what? I didn't hear that. <laughs> I was thinking you're, you're that I would. 
And Jay, it's okay to vote if you are the nominated. You, you may vote for yourself if that is your question. Okay, fabulous. Um, and no more nominations. I want to first want to see if there's any more nominations for chair. Anyone going once, going twice? Okay, now we're going to vote. Um, okay, so uh, start with Edgar. Yes, aye. Aye. And NJ? Yes. <laughs> And uh, Angela? Aye. Lizelle? Yes. And myself? Aye. I think I got everyone. Jordan, are you voting in this? I'm, I'm... Yes, I would like to, like to add a heck yes. Heck yes. All right. OK, it's unanimous. Um, NJ will be the new chair of the Human Relations Commission. OK, I thank you all very much. We'll do my best. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. So next, uh, vice chair, um, we're now going to take nominations for vice chair for the Human Relations Commission. I would like to nominate <laughs> Edgar. I said it first. <laughs> People were talking, yeah. I would like to nominate Edgar Wong Chen for vice chair. Okay, there's a nomination for Edgar. Are there any other nominations? I would like to nominate Lizelle. Okay. And we need a second for um, the nomination for Wang Chen. And then this is Angela. Well, I will second Edgar. <laughs> okay, there's a second for Ed, Edgar for vice chair. And did we, we nominated Lizelle. I'll, I'll, I'll place a second. I'll put a second in for Lizelle. Mm -hmm. Could I uh, defer? Oh, yeah. I would like to defer. Just one moment, Let give me a minute to just get those in the notes. Okay. Okay, I've got them in the notes. Um, we do have a public comment. So I think that maybe you should take that before you do a final vote. Yes. Okay, we're ready for the public comment. Okay, Connor, go, please go ahead. Okay, so first off, uh, I support NJ for chair, and I think either of the uh, vice chair candidates would be good. Um, I'm not sure if either of them have accepted yet though. So I guess that that is one way to defer. So if neither accepts, that would also be, um, there might be a dilemma there. Um, but the main thing I wanted to talk about though was, was kind of the process. So sort of going off of some of Alan's points, I do think it would have been important to take public comment before voting on the chair. And in general, uh, public comment before official votes, I think is, is an important aspect of the process. Um, and I like, I think the, the outcomes are certainly important, but the, the process is important too. And like transparency and making sure that as much public input as possible uh, is able to occur. So that, that is something that I just wanted to bring up for a kind of future reference and for whoever the new chair and vice chair are. Thank you, Connor. Clearly I'm having some struggles with um, my slides right now. Is there any other public comment? I'm muted, I'm muted. Okay, good. There's no other, I mean, okay, we've, Asked if there's any more public comment. Okay, so we voted on chair. Now, uh, has the vice chair um, nominate? Have they accepted yet? We have Edgar and we have Lizelle. But Lizelle, you said you defer. Okay. And I was actually going to graciously decline. Oh. Okay. So, uh, so let me be clear. Defer, Lizelle means you're not. You're declining as well. I, I'm. Exactly. Okay. So are there any no nominations for vice chair at this time? I'd like to nominate Judith to continue. Should she accept? 
I'll uh, send that. Wow. Cool. I, I will certainly, certainly accept that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? I don't see it anywhere. Okay, no other nominations. So there's been a motion and a second. And so now we'll vote having Judith stay as vice chair. Um, we'll go to Edgar. Aye yes. or nay? Aye. Since he seconded it, it makes, makes sense. Uh, Angela? Aye. Lizelle? Aye. And Jordan? Is Jordan here? Hi, sorry. I briefly stepped away from my computer. Um, aye. Okay, and sure, I'll vote for myself. Okay, uh, it's unanimous and- I'm, I'm voting I, I too. <laughs> sorry. Uh, NJ, are you Hi. voting? Hi, another vote. Okay, thank you. Oh gosh, I need to just use my memory instead of following these pictures, this computer. My computer is very old. And I don't think it's doing the top job tonight. So NJ votes aye as well. It's unanimous. So I will remain as vice chair. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, we did it. Is there any other comment? Uh, for, I think we can move on. I think we got it. So, okay, item seven, future agenda items. Uh, move the March meeting to March 31st. Yes, so um, typically the HRC meetings fall on the fourth Thursday of the month. However, that falls directly in the DJUSD and UC Davis spring break. And so we would um, highly, highly recommend moving it to the fifth Thursday of the month, which is March 31st. And we will plan to do so unless there is great opposition. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the plan. Is there any opposition? Uh, tonight to, uh, to moving that date. Let's see if I see any hands up. Uh, I don't see any hands up, so there's no opposition. We're good. And then the rest oh, NJ, of NJ has her hand up, so there we go. We, uh, there is no position um, for me to move the meeting. Uh, it's just while we're on the topic of future future agenda items, I wanted to ask and I understand that the agenda is already really um, full, um, but I was wanting to ask, okay, never mind. I see media hate, so I have no question. Thank you. <laughs> I should make sure to read everything before talking. I, I actually have an addition to the future agenda items, which is uh, extremely timely that we need to get on the Cesar Chavez event on the February agenda. Um, so that will be included so that we can, um, I'll have a lot of preliminary information for you, um, but we'll need to uh, talk about that and make some quick work of either, you know, figuring out a subcommittee to work on planning for that or um, doing some work, uh, you know, at the meeting. I, I don't anticipate it to be a very long agenda item, but it, it is one that we need to um, touch base on. So. Okay, and that follows right that's a segue right into the, am I still muted? No, right into the event planning. That's part of that next step. Um, so we'll have event planning for the future. We'll have the Healing Arts Project. Um, and Jay, you um, were going to do that in November when uh, you were out ill. Will, um, is that something that you still wanted to update on? And what is the, the timing of that? So, in the past, it's been pushed back depending on how full the agenda is because it's a project that doesn't have a timeline on it. So if we ever feel that um, all the other items are more important, um, you know, it's fine. What I can say is that I don't plan on spending too much time on it. I just want to let the word out, give a quick update of what has happened since the Healing Arch project started in 2020. So I'm not anticipating more than, I want to say no more than seven minutes on it, five minutes in terms of presentation, some conversation, and then, you know, public comment included. I don't think it'll go over five, seven minutes, maybe seven. Thank you, I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sounds good. The next item is multiculturalism event for youth in Davis. Does anyone want to comment on that? Anyone? Okay. Next, look into housing language to see if it includes non-discrimination. Comments? 
And, and some of these were, were ideas that people had talked about. Yeah. I, I want a quick comment on the housing language um, and all. Just a reminder that the open house, um, oops, I'm going to open space um, commission. Uh, one of the commissioners um, started working on the same issue, not specifically around language, but looking into discrimination and housing in Davis. Um, so I just want to, you know, put it out there again and ask. I don't know who will be presenting on that item, um, but I think that as we will be talking about it next month, it will be good to make space to see if we want to engage with the Open Space Commission, which is something I hope we do. Um, so Carrie, I don't know what's the procedure, you know, um, if we talk about it first during the meeting and then we follow up by reaching out to the commission once all the commissioners agree. The reason I'm asking you that is because one of the points that we raise is that sometimes with sensitive matters, it seems to take many, many months before we're actually able to <clears throat> even get to the place where we talk about what we really want to talk about, if I'm making sense. You know, NJ, I think this is a really great question and it, it kind of goes into your clarifying question that you raised at the city council meeting about um, commission intersection and the process for it working. So I can't can't provide you an exact answer right now, but I am making a note for me to look into uh, exactly how that would work. It um, would also mean that, you know, that the other commission would have to decide that that is a topic that they want to address and then also kind of find out what council direction is. So let me get back to you on that one, but I am putting it into the notes so that I can um, do so. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, thank you. And next is the HRC role in providing feedback on statues, murals, et cetera. Any comments? Yes, actually, I was the one that was really interested in that, although I've done nothing, but um, maybe Carrie and I can talk about where I can go with this. Okay, sounds great, thank you. And critical race theory, ethnic studies, counter narrative, any comments? Yeah, this was a topic that I brought up and I think my plate's a little full right now, so I'm gonna, kind of wait on this one and just see how things uh, develop in the public. And then if necessary, maybe do like a short presentation down the road. Um, and so yeah, I, I think Kate has something to add. Okay, Kate. I appreciate it. I couldn't remember who to put it on. Um, is it appropriate for me to do a short update right now since I missed the update period um, as this relates to the school district? I think it's fine. And then we'll go on to NJ after that. Uh, Carrie, Carrie well, from, yeah. Uh, for future, we, this is supposed to be future agenda items. Ah, okay. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we, yeah, we would be okay. going out of, oh. of order, Kate. But if it's something that can relate it to how we might talk about it in the future, then sure. Okay. Uh, also, is there is there a final like communications from the commissioners moment at the end of the meeting, or should there, I just... there is there is not. There used to be on the template. There, it's okay. all at the beginning. Okay. So I'll just say in the future, I think it would be um, one of the things we could talk about around this topic is how we might as a community respond when there is, for example, a, an inflammatory article published online at a website such as the Federalist regarding postings on the DJUSD website and um, how that prompts things like um, uh, can prompt things like letters to the Board of Education um, in specifically uh, around uh, anti-racist, racial justice, LGBTQ supports um, that are being provided by the district. And I think that if that conversation can in the future include, uh, you know, how the, how the city and the schools can work together, I recommend it. I think it's very topical and um, one might take a look around to see just how recent and topical it is. Okay, thank you, Kate. NJ, you had something? Thank you, Kate, for your words. Um, I wanted to say that what Kate just shared, I think, uh, intersects with the media hate um, topic as well. Um, and my, I raised my hand because I was wondering, I see the topic on the agenda, and I hope that we talk about it next uh, month. But I was wondering um, if we could clarify how we will go about addressing media hate um, in the commission. 
Yes, I, I think that would be good to clarify how you want it agendized. And I also, before you get very far, yeah. um, you know, kind of going through this list, we should take public comment and then kind of go back to finalizing anything. So um, I might I might suggest that you pause right here to take public comment um, and then hear that and then come back to discussing how you want to um, put the media hate on you know it's been it has been scheduled for for february at this point but how you want to look at it so and then actually um the last thing i'll just quickly add on there is that i did put the student group presentations that alistair and edgar brought up so if you're willing to take public comment and then maybe come back to a little bit more robust discussion about what media hate will look like on your next agenda that would be great um thank you i concur with nj that we should not wait too long with it and I have another comment, but I'll I'll wait till after public comment. So let's hear from public comment right now. So, all right, uh, Alan, you are. Thank you very be... much. You're running okay. a long meeting tonight. You're working hard. Um, two thoughts. Um, Helen Rowland sent in a resignation letter. They had some some pretty strong recommendations about what you should consider. And I know her recommendations may make the city staff a little uncomfortable, but I think your commission should basically to look at it and read it and take it to heart, especially uh, NJ and, uh, and and Edgar. Maybe this is maybe done offline, but I think there's some there's some issues here in terms of uh, the way things are handling and the pace of things. Uh, so I, I hope you take that to heart. And other people read the letter, and I think there's something to be said for there. Um, second thing is a media hate. Thank you, Kate, for of being aware that we need to be upstream in terms of what the source of these, these things are. I think that's important. And uh, I would offer to make a presentation to the commission about uh, media hate and what's going on. It's, I know the Natural Resources Commission and the Budget Commission, as well as the Tree Commission have allowed members of the public to make presentations on agenda items. That also allows the inter interaction discussion with the with commission members. I know when the Planning Commission takes presentations, takes presentations from their developers at the commission. So there's precedent for allowing the public to make presentations and agendaized items. So I would, I'm would i offering to make a presentation on, on media hate. I could work with the subcommittee. Um, I was disappointed there was no action between November and uh, this meeting about that issue. Uh, uh, the, the unfortunate incident in the, in the uh, synagogue uh, in Texas which is my which is which is which has rippled through my synagogue. There have been multiple emails. It is felt very locally here. That it makes us unfortunate. We need to stay ahead of the game on this stuff. And I wish there'd been more progress, but we can move ahead now. And I'm willing. To, I'd like to work with Edgar and members of that committee on a that presentation. I hope that that's that that's a reasonable suggestion. Thank you for all your very 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 important hard work this evening. Okay. Thank you, Alan and NJ. You have your hand up. That was a mistake, sorry. The, oh, your hand up was a mistake. Okay. Um, are there any, I'll just quickly say what I was going to say. I would personally, and you mentioned it earlier, Carrie, I would like a little more <clears throat> specific verbiage on the agenda item, <clears throat> excuse me, for media hate. I'd like to hear, you know, there's some specifics on many of those, several of those items. I'd like to just write it up a little more specifically as what we're looking into instead of just media hate. Obviously that's the title, that's the theme, that's the important, but just writing it up a little more specifics, but that's all I have to say. Are there any more comments on this particular uh, agenda item? And NJ, are you, is your hands up? Uh, yes, no, I, I, my memory came back um, and I'll keep this brief. I was just um, wondering, and this can be also resolved um, offline, but we do have in the commission, a member who um, works for the media and I'm naming Jordan Varney. So uh, Jordan, not putting you you know, on the spot and you don't have to answer now, but I was just wondering if you will consider sharing a few words on the topic next month. So, Angie, are you actually asking Jordan a question directly or are you just? Uh, I was asking Jordan a question. Um, I was worried that it was me. Sorry, the second that you were talking, my headphones cut out. If you would so kindly repeat the thing that you were saying, I would really <laughs> appreciate okay. it. I just pointed out that um, of all the commissioners, you happen to work for a media organization. And I was wondering if you'll be willing to share a few words 
on the topic of media hate and what could be done about it um, next month when um, Alan Hirsch has offered to make a presentation on that. But also since you happen to work in that field, I was hoping you'll be um, open to sharing um, some words um, or not. Yeah, I mean, I can share about um, my experience and, you know, my experience of trying to keep undergraduates safe in our publication because we have them as writers, but they are also, you know, young, impressionable minds. Um, I don't think I have anything super revelatory or anything beyond anecdotal, but I can speak to the things that I have seen and, you know, the what, what we try to do. Thank okay. you for answering my question. Mm -hmm. Very good. Are there any other final comments on this particular agenda item? <clears throat> I don't see anyone's hand up. So, okay, uh, moving on to uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank Leading you, Connor and Alan, Judith for your participation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.